Good morning, folks. First of all, do not watch this if this is going to cause you any mental anxiety or stress. Go and study for your next exam or go and enjoy your study leave. If you're still here, let's take a very quick run through the written part of National 5 2023. Uh, I'll rip through the answers very quickly, except problem solvings, probably. So let's start. Hofbrinkles, as I teach them, the diatomic elements, there are seven of them, however you've learned that. Um, so the answer there is seven. This looks familiar to me. Is this an old question? If the average is 35 and you've got 35 and 37, then that is closer. That is the most common one. Uh, similar chemical properties to chlorine. Any other halogen? I've gone with fluorine. Mm, just because it's bonkers. It's the most interesting, most violent one in the group. Uh, electrons. I know it's got 12 protons to start with, but because it's got a 2 plus charge, you've lost 2 electrons, so that's 10. This one here, the number of neutrons is the mass number, take away the atomic number, so it's 20. Hydrocarbons contain hydrogen and carbon and nothing else. This is an interesting one, sort of a reverse of an addition reaction. If you wanted to make turn this into this, you need to add hydrogen to it. So if you're going backwards, you only be removing hydrogen from it. The test for unsaturation, that's the bromine water test, guys. And in chemistry, you always have to give the colour before and the colour after. So that will be orangey brown colourless. Uh, or something along these lines. You don't have to say exactly orangey brown. Problem solving. We've never heard of ethane. But if it's got a triple bond between the carbons, that only leaves one bond each. That must be the full structural formula for ethane. Uh, you can burn it. Absolutely. It takes a heck of a lot of oxygen, but you can burn it completely. Uh, that's plentiful supply of oxygen. You'll make carbon dioxide and water just like any other alkane or alkene. Burning exothermic gives out heat. Uh, name a group in which all in bold of the elements are metal. Group 2, for sure, not group 3. Starts with boron. Group 1, probably not, because hydrogen's at the top. I don't know. This is the disadvantage of these not being the official answers. You can't use them as an accurate guide, I'm afraid, because I'm not the SQA. Potassium permanganate. Uh, permanganate is in your data book, one of a complex ions, MnO4, its charge is 1, so its valency is 1, so that is the formula. Because I'm an old fart, I put brackets around about complex ions, you probably don't have to. Although, again, I'm not 100% sure. Um, suggest the name for metal X. It's anywhere between magnesium and iron in the electrochemical series, so aluminium or zinc are likely candidates. Or anything else that's between that I've forgotten. Gas produced uh, is hydrogen. Uh, metals react with acid to produce gas. The gas is hydrogen and it burns with a squeaky pop. Sorry, Harry. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, I need to get a date book for this one. Okay, I hadn't checked this one, but yeah, as I thought, magnesium, I'll show you where magnesium is. Um, copper is copper is here. Uh, tin is, can we still on camera? Yes, tin is there, and magnesium is there. Um, so... Uh, iron is between magnesium and tin relative to copper. So the voltage they're looking for is, I would expect, anywhere between 0 0.5 and 2.7. I would I don't know what range, though. I don't know what range. Uh, iron is closer to tin than magnesium. So, uh, question mark. Um, I would imagine the range will be quite broad that they'll accept. Let's move on to some more definite ones. An electrolyte is a conductive liquid. Uh, one factor that should be kept constant in this experiment here to make sure the voltage is fair. I would expect them to accept a large variety of answers here, even though in reality the answers are actually quite narrow. But this is SQA land, so they'll probably accept a load of answers here. The temperature, the depth, the metals are in the distance between them, the type of electrolyte you're using, etc. A close reading question. Um... I reckon the answer is air for that one. Um, catalysts can be reused or they saves energy, therefore it makes things cheaper. Um, I, I'm not sure what the SQ will accept there. Probably something along these lines. Number of moles of carbon dioxide uh, used to make five litres of jet fuel. Well, one litre of jet fuel requires uh, 4,700 grams. This is might be a tricky question because the numbers are just very big uh, but it, it is logical it's quite a good question actually I like it I do like it it just might put some people off because we're not used to dealing with 4,700 grams of something so 5 litres of jet fuel will therefore require 23,500 grams and then all we need to do is turn the 23,500 grams into a number of moles so moles is mass divided by GFM, so that's 23,500 grams divided by 44, 534 uh, moles. 
for that one. Open-ended question. I quite like this is a nice one. I like this one personally because you could talk about it's nitrogen gas we're talking about, so you can talk about the structure of the atoms, the molecules, the fact it's a diatomic. It shares three pairs of electrons. You can turn it into fertilizers via ammonia. You could talk about the Haber process. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can talk about there. Don't forget to put equations and examples in. Maximize your chances of getting three marks, guys. Um, that is the carboxyl group there. Um, uh, when they join, it's polymerization. Would they take addition? I don't know. Again, the disadvantage of me not being the SQA. Draw a section of uh, when you join three of these together. So you just pop three side by side. You break open the double bond, link them all up. Um, I put brackets and bonds to the side just to ensure the marker knows that it's a polymer, but that's probably overkill. <clears throat> um, what's going on here? Problem solving. So we've got the, the expansion of the polymer here. We've got the different salts that you add to the polymer, and each salt was tested with two different, presumably, two different polymers. And they want the combination of material and salt solution that gives the largest increase in size. So you go to this bar here, uh, that's the largest increase in size, and that is cesium chloride, is the salt, and material A is the darker bar, so that's why I've gone with that. Draw a bar on the graph to show the expected swelling for material A in strontium chloride. S they're looking for you to see the pattern here. Magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium. As you're moving down that group, then as you can see, there is an increase. And it's material A, is it? Yeah, so we're looking for the black bars here. So I would expect a bar somewhere along there, but that's why I put that range. I'm not sure what range they will accept. Um, I expect that one to be quite generous in what they'll accept because it's not an accurate, it's a bar graph, not a line graph. Piece of accurate uh, volume uh, for 100 mils, that's a measuring cylinder. Maybe accept a pipette? Not sure. Uh, you have to draw a line graph. Uh, four marks for a line graph. That seems quite generous. I wonder how they'll allocate these four marks. Labels and units, both axes. You have to have the same jump, of course, going all the way, and you have to put, the, it has to be a line graph. Oh, maybe that's what the fourth mark is. It just says graph. So it's three graphs, three marks for a standard graph and fourth for drawing the correct type. Okay, dokie. <clears throat> um, name the third member of the family. This is problem solving. We've never heard of silanes, but if you have a look, monosilane has got one silicon, disilane has got two silicons, so presumably, Three silicons will be trisilanes. Uh, trisilanes, sorry. Um, calculate the number of hydrogen atoms in pentasilane. Well, they're following the same general formula as the alkanes. So CN, H2N plus 2. So I'm going to go with H12. And last of all is good old-fashioned predict the boiling point job. I've worked out the differences here. 68, 55, 45, so I'm guessing perhaps 35-ish for that. I've said here 188 plus or minus something, a few degrees. The SK will decide on that. <clears throat> Diagram for the uh, outer electrons for a molecule of monosilane. Silane here is in group four. So it will have had four outer electrons, which are the crosses here. The dots are the electrons from each of the hydrogens. You don't have to show crosses and dots. You don't have to show circles even. You can show this uh, much simpler version of that. Should still get the mark. Explain why pentasilane has a higher boiling point than tetrasilane. Two marks here. I'm guessing there's one mark for each of these points. The larger molecules of pentasilane compared to tetrasilane or larger GFMs. I think they should accept either. I'm not sure, though. The larger molecules have stronger intermolecular forces or stronger forces of attraction between the molecules. That's why the boiling points are. <clears throat> Disilane... It's producing a, oh, it's it's a mass calculation. Uh, if you're in my class, it's one of the last calculation types that we did, guys. So you have to identify the two chemicals we're interested in, which are these two. You have to look at the big numbers, which are numbers of moles, so that's a two and a one. So that's a two to one ratio. And then we replace these by the masses. According to my sums, the GFM of silicon dioxide is 60. So you need two lots of 60, which is 120. And on this side, there's just one, so it's 62. So 120 grams would have made 62 grams. We didn't have 120 grams. We had six grams of silicon dioxide. So what do we do on this side? We divided that by 20, divide by 20 on the other side, and you get your final answer, 3.1. You can do it with moles. You certainly can. 
you can work out how many moles 6 grams of silicon dioxide is and then you'll have to half that number of moles and then multiply by the GFM and then you'll still get the same answer. It's all good. <clears throat> Three marks for that, by the way. So if you've forgotten to do the two to one ratio, don't uh, knock yourself out too much. You'll still get two out of three. If you've done that one correctly, it's quite an easy three marks. Close reading time. A fluoroapatite. Name of the compound is an interesting one because that's not really a chemical name. That's a mineral name, but whatever. <clears throat> the molecular formula for the chemical used to purify phosphoric acid. That is... Uh, glucose? C6? H6? No, not glucose, you silly old fool. It's that. That's the chemical. Uh, so we just turn that in, just to add up the C's, H's and the O's, you get that. It's too early in the morning. <clears throat> uh, contains phosphorus. Yep, they're looking for the other two elements you find in fertilizers, which are uh, nitrogen or potassium. Um... Why can we use sodium phosphate as a fertilizer? Because it's soluble, or very soluble, in water. Calculate the percentage mass of phosphorus in phosphoric acid. Okay, so there is only one phosphorus here, so it's a th one lot of 31 on the top. On the bottom deck here, we've got the total GFM, 31.6 according to my sums. Please remember, I did these late at night. These could be wrong. This calcium sulfate is a solid, so um, if you're separating it from a solution, it's filtration. And the number of moles of water present for every mole of calcium, a hemihyde, we've never heard of that. So let's go back and have a look at time. And it says here, calcium sulfate can exist in two common forms. The hemihydrate, um, which has got... That, what's going on here? We do not know what this is. So it's sort of problem solving. Time. We've never seen a dot and then the waters. It does say in words, though, the dihydrate form with the dot H2O has two moles of water for every one mole of calcium sulfate. So we can go ahead and assume that that is half a mole of water for every mole of calcium sulfate. Tricky question, though. You can see a lot of people not getting that, so don't worry if you didn't. We are burning crisps here. And it is a CM delta T calculation here, guys. Uh, is that on camera? Yes, it is. So energy and kilojoules, uh, the units given in the question, don't give the unit and the answer, just in case you get it wrong. Um, so we need C, which is constant, because we're heating water up, so C is just 4.18. We need M, tricky, that's the mass of the water, not the mass of the crisps. You notice the mass of the crisp is the very first information given. This is a distractor. Pay no attention to it. Just looking for attention. Um, that's the mass of the water. You've got to divide it by 1,000, annoyingly, to turn it into kilograms, so it comes out in kilojoules. And delta T is just 15. It goes up by 15 degrees. So if you do the calculations, you get that. It is three marks, so don't worry. If you missed one or two points, you'll still get partial marking for that. Suggest why the value of the experiment is lower than expected. Well, because we're burning crisps, and most of the heat's just going to go to the air. It's missing the... I'm, yeah, I'm hoping you had a go at this in National 5. We just certainly did, and we put a box around about to try and keep the heat in. So, loss of heat to the air. There's a few other answers they'll accept for that, so don't worry if you haven't put that one. They should accept a few ones for that one. Uh, this is an interesting question, because it's a higher style proportion calculation that I don't think I've seen before in National 5. I wonder how well most people will get on with this. Um, one gram releases 20.9 kilojoules of energy. It says that here. One gram of a biscuit is 20.9 kilojoules of energy. And they're looking for the energy in a 30 gram biscuit. So the first thing I did was scale it up. The problem here is that is kilojoules and they want the answer in kilocalories. So this is a units game question. So how are you supposed to do that? Well, it says here one kilocalorie is equal to 4.18 kilojoules. So this was my answer in kilojoules. And then it's, I divided by 4.18 to get 150. The reason I've said confusing here is the question's not too confusing, but the very fact that 4.18 here is the same as 4.18 here is it's not coincidence, but there's a technical scientific reason for that. It's just in case it confuses people. Hopefully not. We'll see how you go on. It's worth two marks, so don't knock yourself out over it too much. Uh, cesium metal is bonkers. It's uh, way up the top of the electrochemical series. The only way to get it is electrolysis. If you're turning positive ions into neutral atoms, that's a reduction because the ions are gaining electrons. The beta particle, it's uh, the one with the weird numbers. It's zero on the top and negative one on the bottom of nuclide notation. <coughs> um, 
alpha. Well, I can't use alpha radiation because alpha, you can't get alpha measuring sheets of metal. That's for sure. Couldn't even get it measuring sheets of paper. Stop by paper. <clears throat> half-life definition. It's the time to reduce the mass or the radiation level by half. Simple definition time, guys. This is a three-mark calculation. It's a half-life calculation. Um, the half-life is 30 years. So, and it's a fraction. So if we just start, we assume you start with one because we're going to go to a half and then a quarter and then it, uh, then you get down to here. By the time you're here, you've done four decays. So that's 120 years. You're left with a 16th. But the question is asking how much has decayed. So how much has gone? The answer is 15 sixteenths have decayed. That might not be good for you if your math is a bit shaky. But because it's three marks, you'll still get partial marking. This paper's being rebellious. Sorry, there we go. Uh, this is an interesting one. Tungsten 6 fluoride. It's used in the electronics industry. It's a toxic colourless gas at room temperature. Now, I know it contains a metal and a non-metal, but that's only a guideline on the type of bonding. You're looking for other clues, really. And the best clue is the conductivity, which is not mentioned in this question. If I was writing it, I would have wanted to include that information somewhere, I'll be honest with you. But the clue is the fact that it's a gas is probably covalent, and it's not a network, because if it's boiled at room temperature, it's likely to be individual molecules. Interesting to see in the analysis how many people get that question right. Balanced equation, there you go. That's it balanced. It looks scary at first, but it's actually easy. Describe the relationship uh, in an acidic... Uh, oh yeah, hydrofluoric acid. Interesting. Uh, come back to me at Advanced Higher and we'll discuss hydrofluoric acid. It's not the best one to use as an example here, but nevertheless, there are more hydrogens than hydroxides. That's what you need to say in this one here. Uh, set up the redox equation. The total charge on this side is 6 plus. The total charge here is 4 plus. You need two electrons, and they need to be on this side to reduce this down to 4 plus, the same as this side. Uh, Open-ended question. I love this one. This is a nice one because it's just rates. You can talk about this uh, catalyst surface area. You can draw nice diagrams. Don't forget to do both in order to maximize your chances of getting three marks. Are we done? End of question paper. We're done. Did we do the previous open-ended question? Oh, yeah, it was nice. Silly little fool. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.